Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. Gentlemen, I tried something new or we tried something new for the Lift Your Legacy podcast. Uh, I had the opportunity first time to bring on my wife, Julie. Uh, initially, what she had billed this as was an interview of me. How could I turn that down? Uh, but what it became was a very candid conversation. Uh, we're very thrilled to be working together now, Julie and I, in our coaching profession, uh, working primarily with couples. Um, and you can see a little bit about our story, uh, in this case, a lot about our story. And uh, we're really excited about this opportunity to give you more value and more insight into our life, our marriage and our take on the world. So with no further ado, Julie Rupp. Okay, so, so this is unusual because this is a, a podcast episode where Julie will be interviewing me uh, or maybe we'll just be speaking together and um, we'll see how it goes. Do you not want to be in the hot seat? I would love to. Well, you know me. I'd love to be in the he hot seat. He loves to be in the hot seat. He creates the hot seat for himself at all times. Yeah. I just look for hot seat. Like, it's not there. <laughs> we create it. That is correct. Go ahead. Um, so we, I, don't, I don't even know where to start because obviously I didn't prepare for this, which is like your favorite type of way to speak. Um, what do you think um, has been the biggest shift for us working together most recently? In my perspective, I think that both of us started to take accountability for our own development. Uh, I was telling someone that I was working with that um, at the end of the day, he was suggesting that as he started developing like a, a certain callousness with the way that he felt about the way that his marriage was going, he was afraid about it. He was saying, I'm starting to not to care. And what was very interesting for me was I also experienced that in the sense. Wait, but caring and you said he didn't care. About we were having some. We were having some marital challenges, frankly. <laughs> and um, and what came out of that was that I reached a point for myself where I said this might not go, and I also came to a place for myself where I said that this is that's okay. And I can make a go of it and we'll make a go of it no matter what. And not to say that you might or might not have brought that up or forced me to make those kinds of conversations or, or, or considerations. But what I realized on the other end of that was that whatever time we had was going to be kind of a blessing. So I sort of let go. And I think that it empowered me to A, start to chart my own course and B, it empowered me to create enough space for you where... I started for perhaps the first time in our marriage, um, not having expectations per se and giving you your own space. I think that's really important actually, because I think that, um, I guess it is part of that fear, I would say. Fear creates something in people that makes them like even, that makes them try to go towards the other person in a way that feels like really stifling. Yes. And I think incredibly that, stifling. And I think I guess it, it's it's not so intuitive because you feel like intuitively if you want something and you want to hold on to it, like you should protect it and like you should have a really tight grip on it. But then if you do that, what happens is the opposite. That like essentially the at least for me as the other person in that other end of the relationship, I felt like just so um, like I was like getting, and I always use this in, in terms of us. Like if I feel like backed into a corner, then I'm just going to completely shut off. Right. So I think that that's like a really important piece that you were able to do that. Was that like an intellectual thing or it was just like an emotional, like how did you well, I think come that, to be I able think to that do that's, that? that's the point is that, is that it's called the crucible in the book, Passionate Marriage, of which uh, you can buy that one too. That's a big one. You have to really, uh, you have to really, you have to really want it bad if you can read that book because it's pretty boring. But, um, but, but in the book, Passionate Marriage, they speak about there's something called the crucible where one partner basically reaches rock bottom and they're like, I can't do this anymore. 
And I can't do this anymore means I can't be in the relationship as it's been anymore. And so it almost gives you the freedom to consider like, what do I want? And why am I putting the, uh, up, you know, putting, putting this up? And in one of those posts that's coming, it's going to be great. Like <laughs> I, I never, I never anticipated, but I've always my whole life, not with you, but just in general felt like I was unlovable and that women didn't love me except for my mother. That was never in doubt, but there's all kinds of other issues that we can talk about with that. Um, but as a result of that, like I remember thinking about this, this girl I had asked for home to the homecoming dance. And, um, and, and I was so sure that it was like, she was doing me a favor for saying yes. And, and then with you, I felt like I was always trying to, um, convince you to be with me or to justify you to be with me. And so I started reaching this point and it's really funny because, on one hand, it's always easier to get other people to buy into you when they don't have all of the baggage that you bring, right? It's like they don't have to be married to you. They don't have to deal with you and the kids. They don't have to deal with all of your negative crap. So all you need to be able to do is to just show up and be wonderful for them, mm -hmm. which is something that both of us have, have I, spoken about before. I'm actually really curious about that. What do you mean? Tell me. What did it feel like? This is going to be really Oh, we're having a great time right now. But what did it feel like um, to, to feel that that you were like everyone's, I know you hate this word, but like guru, like you, you everyone loves you, which is so true. Everyone should love you. Um, and, and um, this is literally, by the way, what we learned from our tenure at NCSY, the word and, I and think, yes. by the way. But anyways, Credit goes every, out 100% to Rabbi Derek Gorman. Yes, 100%. A giant of a man. So anyway, um, but... But everybody loves you, and so you got that, I guess, validation. But maybe it wasn't like a true validation because it wasn't an internal validation. But you did get that validation. So how did it feel when you were able to have that position in the spotlight, but then at home it wasn't like that? What was that like for you? It was that it, – it was it, – it exacerbated – it's a great word. It exacerbated what has been a major theme my whole life of being an imposter. And it, again, I've been a rabbi. I, I, I still can't really read Hebrew that well. Um, I've been working in Jewish outreach and I have all of my own crazy situations with Judaism and challenges around Judaism and challenges around traditional Judaism. And again, it's like, it's not a simple thing for me to be able to wear, to wear this kind of a shirt, which is a shirt that I want to wear. And I like this shirt and I love victory and I love, you know, the, 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 uh, but, but like, everyone, all, we all love that shirt. We all, I, everyone's it. right. I know. <laughs> but, but I think the point is that there is this dichotomy within me, which is that I am not qualified to talk about what I'm talking about. And so the more that our marriage fell apart, again, you actually is, brought but it up. Is that just your perception? Oh, no. Now, as I've learned, thank you. And I can shout out all of the people, specifically um, Gita and David that helped me work through this. And, and a bunch of other people, and you helped, uh, um, that I've, I, I have moved back into a place where I frankly, I am, I'm good for myself. And whoever resonates with the message that I'm able to give over, I'm for them. And if you're not, that's great too. And I'm okay with that. And I'm fine. And I think that that was the switch that I made, which is that at a certain point, because you said like, how are you going to marriage coach all these people if we're divorced? And I'm like, F it. Like I, oops, there we go. Um, but it's like, I, I, that's fine. That's totally fine. I'll do that. And people can listen to it and people can, again, because I think that there's a certain, I would always find the people that would talk about the beauty of marriage and give all the speeches over and they get divorced and be like, see, it's not so easy, you idiot. And again, I, that, that, I, go, I mean, go. I don't, I think that I, personally, I feel like it, it's not just about I don't, I, for anyone that sees, has seen me or like knows me, um, you guys know, I don't love, I don't like sugar, 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 <laughs> it's a Hungarian way of saying it, <laughs> sugar coating anything, sugar, <laughs> I put sugar in my coffee, um, I don't like to sugar coat anything, but at the same time, I also don't want to portray something that isn't there so like if there's if there's good dynamics then a hundred percent and if if the dynamics have struggles then great that's also fine like you know in you know i guess it's just that question of like really being true and honest i am looking for a savior i am 100 percent looking for a savior i i i am the kind of kid that thank god found orthodox judaism because i would have been in any other savior type situation and i know that now 
And that's hard to say because in a lot of ways it shows that I'm not the um, analytic thought through, you know, oh, I look at truth and I only discern truth. It's like, no, anyone that would give me a straight, clear answer on something, I would buy it. And that's why I have such a deep hatred and distaste when I find a lack of integrity, which is something that I've been accused of a lot. And um, so I think the piece for me was I expected that Judaism or I expected that my life or my role as a leader, like I could go there as a shelter for actually having to do with my stuff. And so, whereas you didn't have that, and again, it's hard for me even to, like, this is such a huge thing. I'm like, you're like, yeah, that's only your baggage. I'm like, oh, really? Like, I thought that's what everyone was, you know, like, but, but for me, it was, if I'm not this guy, if our marriage is not this way, then the whole thing comes crumbling down. And again, for me, and now I know Riff Cook, the famous uh, rabbi of Israel, talks about this, you know, that like, that's part of it. That's what, that's what he says, you know, very spiritually aligned, righteous people go through, was eventually they have to just be willing to let the whole thing fall down because it's not aligned with their values. And, and you're right. So like, what would it have looked like? It would have looked like what it became, what it is. Does that, what do you think about that? I don't know. I mean, I think this is very, uh, yeah. I mean... No, I, I'm getting, uh, there's so many things to talk about, so I'm just kind of like figuring out what's what we should take from there. Um, I'm, I'm not going to step in and give you give you my visionary <laughs> status. I would like you to, what, 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 what came up for you? Um, I didn't do such a good job listening. <laughs> Honesty. Honestly, I think, that, I think it's really well, important let's look to at that. be about. Be, look, yeah, right. Let's let's look I at got, that. I got. I got. I forgot what I was asking, and then I I was trying to listen. To you were what asking how saying. I dealt with the imposter syndrome. Uh, see, this is actually like marriage communication or just life communication one on one. Is that when you are in, actually engaged, there's really no one of those things that again we we are coaches, we train coaches, and and I love coaching. Um, but one of the things that coaches have that, that people, again, this is also my personality, but like, there's no structure to coaching. Be like, well, what are the, what are the, you know, what are we, how's, and it's like, I don't, I don't freaking know. Like it's going to go wherever it has to go. So that was a great example of that was, it's like, it doesn't matter what the question was in a lot of ways because you were in, actually engaged in thinking about what I was saying. Hence that validation for you, which you think you're like, you know, you think to yourself like, how am I ever going to coach? Or, you know, I don't have 10,000 clients like Jacob Ruff. And it's like, well, no, but you actually listen really well. And that's what people are actually looking for. So I appreciate yeah, that. That's, that's a strict, that's a strong, that's a strong. But suit. also, that's also the, just the way that you structure things. Some people like to have more structure. And I think that that's also a valid thing. hundred percent. And I actually, to expound on what we spoke about earlier, the way that I think that we have been able to work together so well is kind of a newfound respect for each other's zones of, of comfort and like areas of expertise. That's where the love which, yeah. which we've we've always known that. Like intellectually we've always known that, but we've never really been able to like emotionally open up the space to accept each other in that place. Um and 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 you know appreciate that and figure out how to structure it in a way that it works for both of us. What I was just doing was I was re waiting for you to finish talking so that I could so that I could start talking. And, and so that's not <laughs> so what, that's not what you're either. supposed to that's not what you're supposed to know. <laughs> you were listening, I wasn't listening. Oh. But now of course I forgot so there's really no value uh, to, to, to 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 having that kind of a perception. But but I I think what were you saying right before that? About us finally being able to so, work together. Right. So what I realized was what I perceived all of your struggles were were literally my own demons that I wasn't willing to deal with. So I have a tremendous For example. scarcity, scarcity that I remember talking to people. And again, I'm thrilled talking about this because like I talk about other people, you know, other people are like, well, how do you understand my life so well? I'm like, because I live that. So when we were going through our severe financial trouble, of which, you know, again, I love throwing around $50,000 in debt. That's a lot I'm of money. Not sure. you didn't, See, you it's so awkward. You like, like, I'm like, please don't say yeah, it. I don't know. 50K, why. baby. We, Julie's like, how are we going to pay this? I'm like, Jesus, I have no idea. Um, but, uh, but, but, sorry. So, no, so, I was going to say, like, it's, 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 we were, we actually just were listening at one of the massive things that it's like such a, um, what was the Esther Perel? Like the, the I think, uh, uh, taboos, 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 like taboo subjects. One of the three taboo subjects is around money. And it's just so true. Like nobody talks about how much they make or nobody talks about 
what is actually happening. And I think that that, especially in the religious Jewish world, for those of you who are in that space who are watching us, it's like, it's something that like, why is it such a source of shame? Because like, we associate our value in, to it. Everybody is in the same boat. No, so that they that's the point. Some people started completely differently. And some people started completely... And, and people have different mindsets. No, there's a lot of people in the same boat. Oh, who don't have money that are embarrassed about it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't care. I'm saying, like, there's... I don't attach the shame know, to it. I don't care. But, but also, I think this is so important because for me, it's the... It's the it's you the, definitely cared when we were in that No, situation. it's terrible. And I wish I would have talked about it more because... First of all, I was furious at God because here I was a rabbi and I was broke. And again, you think to yourself, yeah, idiot, because you're a rabbi. Why, if you wanted to make money, go go make money. But I I, I, I thought God had let me down. I was completely uh, like a, like when I would pray, would pray from such a horrific place of a lack. And again, I'm not blaming anyone for this. I'm bl I'll blame myself. And I and I look at some of my family patterns also, and it's like the victim mentality for me is super difficult to be around because I am so much in that mentality. It's like, oh, it's just so hard. That's why, you know, again, not to get, not to go on that, on that route, but what, when I, I would have paid money, I would have paid money to have been, not when I didn't have it, right? I would have paid money to have been able to document my loser mindset, so to speak, my broke mindset, my financial mindset at that time. And it was just like this pure desperation. I wasn't a good enough person that God would support me. How could I do all this stuff for God? And he wouldn't get like, what? Like, and it's just, but it's just so interesting. I want to point out that like, for me, I never saw our situation as a product of a divine, a, a, a divine, divine punishment. A divine punishment. Right. Cause I so bought I into it because I thought God would take care of all my problems. hundred percent. That's the point. So my point is, again, had I, had I been open about my, and again, I felt like my, my organizations that I worked for failed. It, again, it, it was, it was, it was in my head in the sense that like we created this dynamic. And, and again, that's why I, I had an opportunity to talk to someone yesterday who I see is like pushing himself and putting his content out and he works for a certain Jewish organization. And I'm like, look, idiot. I didn't say idiot. I, I didn't mean idiot. I, I, I just say that to people because I, I feel like I'm an idiot. Hopefully he's not saying this. Right. But I said, look, you're really good and you better start monetizing that stuff while you're still getting that money because you don't, you don't want to find out like, like, like in situations that we were in where it's like, okay, I have this passion. I want to get out there, but it's going to take time to get it off the ground, if that makes sense. So, so I just lived in that mindset of being, of being small and being broken. And that, and that's, that's a very difficult piece. But again, so I just, that was a completely different piece. You were asking, yeah, but what, what was an example of, of how my trauma I reflected on you? Sure. So, so again, and that's a good news is that I, I, I thank God have the opportunity to speak to quite a few extremely financially successful people on an ongoing basis. And none of them are sitting back and just throwing out money like it doesn't matter. They have their eye on the economy and they're terrified. They're looking at their assets and they're trying to protect them. So just because you have, you have financial abundance, you have a lot of money, doesn't mean that you don't, you don't care about it or you ever reach that point. And one of my, one of my close mentors told me that I said, I said, you know, do I ever reach a point where I don't stress out about money? And this, Again, he's a he's a dear close friend of mine and lives in this beautifully abundant lifestyle. And he says, I'm terrified about it all the time. I think about it all the time. I'm like, well, I don't have to learn, I don't have to wait until I have the kind of kind of financial freedom that you have for me to start dealing with like, okay, how do I how do I look at money and, and its value to me? And I'm not suggesting in any way, God forbid, that he doesn't look at it the right way, but it was a it was a real shake for me that I thought I was gonna go somewhere or make some kind of money that suddenly I wouldn't worry about this stuff. So the point is. When I was dying with money, and and you and, and and again your method. So I work, 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 work until again. Even I'm not doing anything because because I feel like if I do something, anything, even if it's not intelligent, I just work hard. Somehow, like there's going to be money. And you are the opposite. You go to sleep. You go to sleep when you're stressed out, and you're like, oh, well, <laughs> I'm I'm going to go take a nap. And I literally felt like a train was going to run me over because you were sleeping and I was so angry at you for sleeping. And again, it's not like I was making any more money just by being busy, right? But the, the idea is for me that what I realized as I was thinking about us working together was that you're, again, anyone that knows anything. I think, by the way, sleep was a coping mechanism. But that's, what, that's what I'm saying. I actually just, that was part of the podcast we were listening to yesterday. Did you? Yeah, did you, you just go into stress and you go to sleep. That, that it was like, it, instead of, what it fight fight or flight you just like you just stop some people stop yes. yeah and they also said like some in some cultures like the death of a child doesn't create sadness it creates a sense of be feeling sick that the mind just re reacts to all kinds of ways 
and it's completely socially dependent. So that's that's the point. So you're dealing with stress by going to sleep. I'm dealing, and both of us were in very existential life crises about where we were going and what our purpose was and, and what we were going to do. And and so my lack of faith in myself, in in God, in the future, I put all that crap on you. And I'm like, you are letting me down. And if you would just get up. And so as we, and again, anyone that knows, there's a book, Julie's working through it, called, his name's Gino Wickman. He's written the, the Traction and Rocket Fuel and all these books that in every great business, you have someone that functions as the ideas person and someone who's able to bring it down into reality, which again, not to go into the Kabbalistic role of men and women, now, God forbid, of, but but this idea that that there is a value to multiple types of intelligence. And my perception wasn't, wow, I've married a winner and she's going to help ground my insanity. I was, what the hell's wrong with her? I'm out here dying by myself. And, and, and again, so like, and that's, and that's as we started to build that relationship. And again, that's that same thing for you. Like, that's an, a, a great example of how I could have gone to any therapist, marriage coach, whoever it is, and lied to them that my wife is an underproductive wife, but really... I have a problem when it comes to how I trust people and my own sense of self, and that's my crap. It has nothing to do with you. Right. I mean, that piece doesn't have to do with me. Obviously, there was just a lot of struggle, um, if you want to call it that. Um, but it's interesting because while you were thinking like I wasn't doing anything, I was just thinking that you were like you're. Ju- I that I was alone like I didn't know what to do right right? and I think that it wasn't that piece for anyone watching this what you just said this is why you have to be on these calls because I would never say it but that piece that's the most important thing go ahead no but I then I was gonna say just like because I didn't know what to do so I did nothing and I kind of just like like What's that word? Like, I was like, I was stagnating. I was just like a drunken toddler, like, kind of like stumbling around and doing random different things. I don't know if our toddlers get drunk. I think it's either a drunk or a toddler, <laughs> not a drunken toddler. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so that that's what I was doing. And I think, it, I, and I think we were just both really too insecure to tell each other, like, what the we, truth. Yeah, the truth, like, of what we needed. Like, we didn't look deeper. Like, why, what, wh- how is this a symptom of what's really going on? Well, like, I, you just thought I was just, like, wasting time and lazy. But really, it was, like, underneath that. Like, you And you know, could have told and, me maybe... yesterday, don't... someone told me, like, she, she told me, like, oh, I'm, I'm bored. And, I, and I'm thinking bored is just, like, not an, not an adjective that most, like, 30-somethings with a lot of kids using these days. I mean, she's and disconnected. And so it's right. something like so much deeper, like disconnected from herself or just like really like a deep sadness is like just shutting off so that there's like nothing in your brain. but And that creates boredom, but really it's not boredom at the core of it. I think that that piece is the most crucial that you brought that up is that how things show up is indicate indicative of something deeper going on. And yeah. also this idea that we don't. So I guess, stop, because I think when 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 you can look at it from that perspective of becoming curious versus blaming yes and it's like a curiosity about yourself and other people around you the people that you're closest to it's like if you can be curious about your spouse or like or your child because right like kids always act out and you're just like just stop it (laughs) but like really why they're usually scared or they're usually there's some sort of uncertainty or like with your spouse they're just you know it's like you're like why are you acting like that because i know you love me right so if you're if you love me, like what's the real reason? And just being open to hearing that, it, I think for me to be honest, like that was like such a scary piece to actually hear that feedback from what you, feedback? feedback about myself and f- and feedback about why you were unhappy. I like, would have validated I was your too, worst feelings. Too, too scared to yeah. ask you. I, and and yeah, hundred percent. And I think that as a, as a man, also that that sense that I'm not providing for my family, I'm not able to make my wife happy, I'm not able to, again, that for sure, and that that feedback I internalize is I'm failing, and it's like no, you were going through a difficulty, and it really didn't have much to do with me. Right, and at the same, and it's true. This is money, it's, man. It's, this is like big stuff. This is important. But like, okay, we have one minute. We have one more minute. One I minute, think we little. should just end the fact. The idea of what we started with is like the idea of taking responsibility, right? That's how we. Um, if we take responsibility for our own role, so then we can both um, shine 
You know what I mean? Like, and not step on each other's toes. Right. And, um, and, but, but and when taking, blaming comes up, realizing that that's like, not productive. Yeah. So, it, but it's exactly, but also not blaming yourself. Like that oh. has been like the key core thing. It's like, you don't just displace the blame to the next closest person or to yourself. Like you, you, you don't, there's no place for blame. Because like blame creates shame, and then shame creates like hiding. So the idea and it just di- buries the actual problem below a, a mountain of rubble. That's another word that that is probably more appropriate. That's right. <laughs> anyway, so, so so I think the practical piece for people to walk away from with this is the idea that you your world is literally a reflection of you, and. That's why, again, now... So oh, gosh, no, that no, is so... What? Okay, what? we can't go into it, but, like, it's... it's dude, nobody wants to hear that. If no. we're still around to hear that piece... It's the worst. People hate it, but that's all Think point about is, it, but not too hard. Right, and, 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 and people really blame tough. God, or no, you know, again, in the religious world, it's like, well, this is what God wants for us. It's like, maybe you're looking at God through your own image, which is, again, the angry, judgmental God that's waiting to call me a piece of crap and I'm not good enough, that's not actually God, that's my dad. That's all of these other people in my life that, that didn't believe in me. That's me not believing in me. That's not God. God, like, why and do for, I... I'm going to say this and you're not going to like I love it, it, but maybe your dad was never even saying those things. Oh my God, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, that's, always... that, maybe that's something that you, like, superimposed on him to make things, like, very black and white and very clear. Jesus. Um, all right. We're going to end on We're that. We're going to end on that one. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. You See, this really wasn't an interview with me. This was a discussion between two evils. A... <laughs> not, not, that, that's, that's I would important. have loved to interview you, but then I get lost in my... We'll do, we'll do that next time. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Okay. There you have it, folks. Another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, We have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.